Welcome to the Three Down Nation podcast. I'm Justin Dunk, joined by John Hodge and J.C. Abbott. Today, we're discussing all four upcoming games in the first and opening week of the 2023 CFL season. Drama surrounding Jonathan Kongbo and his departure from the BC Lions. Hangy Lawler being placed on Winnipeg's suspended list. LL Cool J throw it back, baby, playing the BC Lions home opener. And the Calgary Stampeders cutting longtime left tackle Derek Dennis. But first. Three Down Nation reported the television ratings from the CFL's preseason action. TSN only broadcasted two games with RDS, their French language affiliate, showing Montreal's home exhibition game. Saskatchewan and Winnipeg led the way with a rating of 362,000 on Friday, while the Alouettes and Red Blacks attracted 276,000 eyeballs between TSN and RDS combined in week one of the preseason. Last week's game between Hamilton and Montreal drew an audience of 140,000 on RDS alone. Are those ratings a positive for the three down league? Well, first off, kudos to you, Mr. Dunk, for getting the RDS numbers. I know that's been a contentious issue, particularly for Alouettes or Red Blacks broadcasts where people are upset. Well, this number from TSN isn't fully representative because obviously some people prefer to watch in French, which is legitimate. But at times, RDS has also been very coy about their ratings and how they do or don't differ uh, from TSNs, at least from a relative perspective. So kudos to you. We're giving our readers, listeners, etc., a full view of exactly how many Canadians watch these. We don't have numbers for streaming, but it's also on TSN to release those numbers if they want to. So I thought the ratings all in all were good, and I'm wondering if TSN regrets axing a couple of broadcasts from their preseason schedule. They were initially supposed to show four games. Four games became two. Yes, RDS did a third one for the Alouettes at home, but these are respectable ratings. They would be a bit disappointing for regular season matchups. Regular season, you like to see at least 400,000. Anything above 500,000, I think is considered good, minus the exception being like marquee games, like the Labor Day Classic, things like that, where you like to see larger audiences. But for preseason, I mean, when, when you're getting over 350,000 people as an average tuning in, to me, that's a very positive sign, even if it is, of course, as we know, Rider Nation propping up some of those numbers yeah that that's a fact we've got two of the the strongest fan bases in terms of television numbers in that preseason game so of course those numbers are going to be inflated but i was quite pleased to see 140,000 tuning in on rds for the alouettes preseason game i was impressed by those numbers and yes they've got to put those numbers out there because now they've got pierre carl pelado breathing down their neck trying to take the rights in a couple years so they got to prove that they're bringing in those numbers and that's going to be a benefit to the public being able to see all that i was impressed with the numbers it's a step in the right direction for the league to put the numbers into context that riders bombers game did a higher rating than at least a handful of games last regular season and it even beat full week averages from the regular season last year for all the people out there who want TSN to broadcast more preseason games they should point to this and I would argue that for sure and hate it or not both Saskatchewan Rough Riders preseason games should be on network television arguably the Blue Bombers games with this dynasty that they have potentially going on there should be there as well and even the Hamilton Tiger Cats they've traditionally been strong and So have the Toronto Argonauts. They have much more people that watch them on TV. And I know it's not possible to get that many people in the BMO field as what watches on television, but that watch them on TV compared to the amount that actually show up at BMO field. So I think that puts those numbers in proper context. And in reality, whether it's regular season playoffs, Grey Cup or preseason football, when you can draw ratings like this one, 362,000, you can make money as a TV network off of that. And that's proven by looking at the ratings just compared to last year and some of those late season, regular season games I talked about. Yes, maybe some of those were meaningless in the standings, but ratings are ratings and you can make money off that. And I think this should be impetus for the league to go to TSN and say, look it, we want to get more of our preseason games properly broadcast by you guys. And it's worth it because of 
this rating that the riders and bombers brought in and also the one that the alouettes and red blacks combined for almost 300,000 on tsn and rds well and we don't know what the cfl's preseason broadcast did because we know that the cfl itself broadcast the rest of the preseason games that weren't televised uh, but to me, I mean, I saw a lot of buzz again. This is totally anecdotal, but I saw a lot of buzz about those games on social media, with the exception of the BC Saskatchewan game that had some breakdowns, unfortunately, with the stream at a few points. I thought generally the streams were very good considering it was a free product. Um, and I really like that the Edmonton Elks hired a special crew even to commentate that game between Winnipeg and Edmonton at Commonwealth Stadium. I thought that was a nice touch. It's better than simply syncing the radio broadcast. So for me, that was a win. I wish we had those numbers. We don't, but I agree, Dunk. I think this is a way that the CFL can go, hey, you know, yeah, it's preseason, but arguably people are hungrier for CFL football now than they will be at any point over the next five months because it's new, it's fresh. They want to see these new jerseys. They want to see the new players. They want to see these fresh teams. And as we know, boys, hope springs eternal nobody is more optimistic than a cfl fan at the start of june right but just just by nature league a couple of these teams are gonna suck and right now <laughs> nobody cares everyone is convinced that their team is gonna hit the over under on win total and they're gonna have a record setting you're like everybody like you can't beat hope and that is what we have at this time of year it's inevitably gonna come crashing down at some point because again there's nine teams it's impossible for all nine teams to have a good year. But right now, hope is what sells. The BC Lions traded Canadian defensive end Jonathan Kongbo to the Hamilton Tiger Cats barely a week after he signed with his hometown team following a stint in the NFL. After TSN's Farhan Lalji reported that Kongbo wasn't a fit in BC's locker room, Kongbo took to Twitter to claim that he called out star players for not showing up to practice and other players for not wanting to work out. He also wrote, quote, culture matters. It's called pro football for a reason, close quote. Keon Hatcher, one of the team's star receivers, clapped back at Kongbo, claiming that he quit on the team after his feelings were hurt due to a lack of playing time. Dunk. What do you make of this absolute mess in BC? I make of it that there was a culture clash there. And let's look at Jonathan Kongbo's recent resume. All right. He was part of two Grey Cup championship teams with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in 2019 and 2021. He just recently played in the NFL, made a good chunk of change there, and has played SEC football at a high level at the University of Tennessee, was one of the best JUCO players, junior college players coming out in his year out of Arizona. Western, I believe it was. So this guy holds himself to a high standard. And clearly he felt like that standard was not high enough for the rest of the BC Lions in that locker room at training camp in Kamloops. So I can understand where Kongbo is coming from in terms of not feeling like he's a fit there. But I don't necessarily think that can be viewed as a problem. This is pro sports, as Kongbo stated, and you need to hold your teammates to higher account. And that's what the Winnipeg Blue Bombers have done. And they've been in the last three Grey Cups and won two of those. So I don't necessarily think it's a mess. I think it is a very confident player coming into a culture that he feels needs to be changed. And if you look at it, the BC Lions have one of the longer Grey Cup droughts in the CFL. Now, I'm not saying that's all due to the current culture that's there right now. And they're obviously coming off a revitalized season that was largely led by Nathan Rourke. And I don't think this would have happened if Nathan Rourke was there. I'll say that for sure. But I think Kongbo will feel better about where he's going to the Hamilton Tiger Cats that are clearly doing all they can to get to a home great cup with Bo Levi Mitchell at quarterback. Yeah, suddenly from a football standpoint, I mean, the Tiger Cats already had Mason Bennett. They already had Kwaku Boateng in-house, and they have some intriguing guys on the interior of that defensive line as well. Mohamed Diallo, I still think, has a very high ceiling. So from a Ticats perspective, this is a great move for them. It's a very low-cost trade for them. On the flip side, to me, this is the exact type of drama the BC Lions did not need. And I'm not blaming Jonathan Kongwo for this drama. Obviously, he was unhappy in BC, which is unfortunate given, boys, that he's from 
Surrey. He, I mean, he was born overseas, but he was raised right there in the heartland of British Columbia. We talked about it on the show a couple weeks ago after he signed. It's like this is a match made in heaven. And it turned out to be a match made in the opposite of heaven. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that word on the show. So this is a disappointing ending, I think, for what was supposed to be a good marriage. I mean, the, the Lions, I don't think, will miss Congo very much from a depth standpoint. They got Francis Bemi in the first round, who I know, JC, you and I are very high on out of the draft. They've also got David Menard, who's perennially underrated. Batchu Betts coming off a very, very good season last year. They've also got Joshua Archibald out of McGill, who's going into his second year. So from a, a football standpoint, I think the BC Lions are going to be just fine. But clearly, there is a bit of a power vacuum in that locker room because it's never a good look. I mean, don't get me wrong. We love it at Three Down Nation when players are openly feuding on social media, but it's not a good look from a team standpoint when going into a very important season opening game against a tough West Division rival in the Calgary Stampeders. You got guys barking back and forth on Twitter instead of focusing where their attention needs to be. Mm -hmm. Look, I, I can't tell you who's right in this feud right now. I suspect it's a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B, right? Both sides probably have legitimate grievances. But what I would say is suggesting that the BC Lions right now don't have a winning culture seems a little bit off. Certainly the season that they had last year with Nathan Rourke at the helm, they're the second best team in the league all season long. And they continue to win games even when Nathan Rourke was out with in with injury and Vernon Adams Jr. For as much as I've been critical of some of his play in the past, he's done a great job of taking on that leadership role this off season, bringing the guys together in the off season, doing additional workouts, having off season camps down stateside with all of his receivers to ensure that that culture continues. And on Kongbo's side, yeah, maybe he might have a legitimate grievance with one player or another. But when you're coming into a new locker room, and let's remind us, I mean, Dunk went through the resume. It's impressive all the stops and all the teams that Kongbo has played for, but he has never lived up to expectations at a single one of those stops, right? He came in at Arizona Western, was a fantastic JUCO player, the top recruit in the entire country, disappointed over a couple years at Tennessee, never lived up to the hype, came in, was simply a rotational player with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. I don't think he was ever an impact guy, certainly valuable because of his Canadian, Canadian status and his ability to contribute in the rotation, but not a star by any stretch of the imagination. And his stints in the NFL have been training camp here, PR stint there, a few snaps when there's some injuries. This is not a guy who should come into a locker room and say, I'm the dude, right? You have to acknowledge that there's a leadership group already there and and lean on them to, to do the, that work, to hand that over. And, and perhaps with time, as your role grows on the field, you can be more vocal. But when you come in and make a stink within the first week of arriving at a new team and you don't back it up on the field or you don't have that reputation, that's going to cause serious problems. And so the BC Lions, I think, were right to move on quickly so this doesn't become a problem within the locker room. And they did a good job at least getting some sort of asset back in return in what is really an unfortunate situation for a player that I had high hopes for coming home to Vancouver. I will say breaking the starting lineup in Winnipeg with Willie Jefferson and Jackson Jeffcoat probably wasn't realistic for anybody, but I do think your point is well taken, JC. I didn't think Jonathan Kongbo quite lived up to the hype in the peg, but maybe he's got that chip on his shoulder now with the transition to Tiger Town, and I cannot wait. I really wish BC and Hamilton played earlier in the season. We got to wait until the fall, unfortunately. Speaking of those games, we're going to break down all four games for you, and we're each going to make one betting pick. Please visit 3downnation.com for all your betting needs. Visit our odds page. We've got lines for all the games across a bunch of different sports books. So if there's a line you like or don't like, come shopping at 3Down. There's probably going to be a line that you do like across the different affiliations that we have. And that is a great way to support the site. If you want to support the news that we break and the things that we do over at three down nation, 
JC, a game that you're going to be watching very closely covering those BC Lions. The Lions are set to open the CFL season with a visit to McMahon Stadium and the Calgary Stampeders on Thursday night. The Stamps have opened as three and a half point favorites, though we will all be picking games straight up and against the spread on Thursday with 10 of our contributors on the site. We want you to give us a sneak peek now. Tell us who you're picking and why. Well, this is the dawn of another new era in BC. Last year, it was Nathan Rourke's team. Now it's Vernon Adams Jr. And he's been around for an entire offseason. And I think that has done wonders for him. We didn't get a chance to talk about it because we're getting right into the regular season. But his pre preseason performance last week was absolutely stellar. He was 12 of 12 for over 200 yards, three touchdowns, ran for almost another 30 Looked incredibly on point, crisp, clean, collected in the pocket, got the ball out of his hands fast. I was I was hyperbolic on Twitter. I said it was the best I'd ever seen Vernon Adams Jr. play, and he agreed with me. In the press conference after the fact, he said he has never felt more comfortable in his entire CFL career. So if that stays true in the regular season, right now the Lions are three-and-a-half-point underdogs. I'm taking the Lions to win this game if Vernon Adams Jr. looks anything like he did last week. Our colleague and resident Calgary Stampeders analysis man, Ryan Ballantyne, won't really like that pick. But I can see the value there with Vernon Adams Jr., certainly, especially after that preseason debut. And the way that he's seemingly really got into a rhythm with offensive coordinator Jordan Maximic, I think that's the secret sauce here for the BC Lions. Nathan Rourke had some otherworldly talent and production last year before he hurt his foot and was on the shelf for most of the season until coming back in the playoffs. But Maximic's ability to fit the Lions offense of so the quarterback that is in there has been tremendous. And it was shown last year when Adams Jr. down the stretch there for BC when he was filling in for Rourke until he got back through six touchdowns and only one interception. That's some of the most consistent football we've seen Adams Jr. play in his entire CFL career. So he's got some targets there with Dominic Rimes and Keon Hatcher. And if Lucky Whitehead is healthy, then I think it can be a dynamic offense. They need to protect him well. But I think there is definitely value there with the Lions going in to Calgary. And Vernon Adams Jr. has some good mojo there. He played well at McMahon Stadium last year so i like the side that jc is on and i would double down on it with him i also wonder if we'll see another fight in the parking lot but that's a question for another day i'd forgotten about that lucky <laughs> oh, whitehead you... versus camera judge grudge match i will be in attendance at mcmahon stadium so i'm gonna park myself in the parking lot after the game watching making sure that there are no fisticuffs Ooh, jc the policeman the Hamilton Tiger Cats and Winnipeg Blue Bombers will play at IG Field in the peg on Friday night. Football with the home side opening as four and a half point favorites. Hodge, the Bombers are the most veteran laden team in the CFL while the Tiger Cats are looking to get their new look club to come together quickly. Who do you have winning this contest and why? Well, I've got let's let's start with this. It was a weird preseason in Winnipeg because traditionally teams will start their starters at home and then they send their their young guys on the road. And that's not what the Blue Bombers did. They did the reverse because the preseason ended this past Friday. The regular season starts on Friday. Mike O'Shea didn't want to just give his starters six days of rest. He wanted to give them extra time. So I did not get a chance to see Winnipeg starters at IG Field when they lost to the Saskatchewan Rough Riders and frankly looked really bad in that opening half. Yes, the Saskatchewan Rough Riders sent a lot of their starters. By my count, by the way, the Bombers had eight out of 24 regular starters in the starting lineup. Uh, the Saskatchewan Rough Riders sent almost all of their starters, at least for the first few drives of the game. But I was not impressed with what I saw from Winnipeg. Do I think they're going to win this game? Yes, but I love this line for the Hamilton Tiger Cats. But Levi Mitchell is on his revenge tour. Yes, there's a lot of new pieces. He's got Duke Williams. He's got Joel Figueroa protecting his blind side. He's got James Butler in the backfield. Jameer Thurman is the new man in the middle running that defense in Steel Town. I like the Ticats' chances of coming in and playing this game really close. I think they could win it, boys. Let's not forget 
The Bombers came out of the gate slowly last year. They got badly outplayed, I thought, at IG Field by the Red Blacks, were it not for some late game heroics from Drew Brown and some terrible clock management from Paul Apolise, the team's head coach last season in Ottawa. The Red Blacks would have won that game. So I love this line for the Ticats. Bombers, I still think, will win. But boys, I will not be shocked at all if the, the reigning Grey Cup runner-ups, I guess I could call them that, start off the season 0-1. I really wouldn't. I'm really torn about this matchup because on one hand, I love all the additions that Hamilton has made. But we know when you bring in a lot of new weapons, a lot of new faces both on both sides of the ball, to a football team, it takes a while for them to really build chemistry and mesh as a unit, right? Football is not an individual sport. You all have to be on the same page. And so it may take some time for the Hamilton Tiger Cats to look at their peak level. But on the flip side, we've talked for a long time about how old the Winnipeg Blue Bombers are getting. At some point, it's going to have to bite them, right? All of these distinguished veterans that they've kept around and kept around at some point there is going to be a step back for these guys and you look at their training camp and there's some big name players who didn't participate an awful lot right and these are guys you trust to step in in week one if they're healthy even without a lot of practice but you wonder how they're going to look without much seasoning Jackson Jeffcoat has been hurt for a lot of training camp Adam Big Hill has barely participated. Even one of their younger guys in Brady Oliveira, the starting running back, has not participated much in training camp. So are we going to see a full strength Winnipeg Blue Bombers or are we going to see an older, more beaten down version that will need some time to get up to speed? I'm I'm with you, Hodge. I'm not sure I'm going to pick Hamilton to win, but I think they definitely cover this game. And that five point line is way too large. In my opinion, JC, don't get worried at all, man. These veterans are just resting, getting revved up for the regular season. I have no issue thinking that Adam Big Hill, Brady Olivier, or anybody else that had a slow start during training camp, like, bro, we talking about training camp, like Alan Iverson out here talking about practice. We're talking about training camp for these veterans. They don't need training camp, man. They'll be fine. But I do think the Bombers have come out slow the last couple of years. They found ways to win. But in week one in general, from a betting perspective in the CFL, it's smart to take the point. And I think that is prudent here with the Tiger Cats getting around five as we tape this on Tuesday afternoon. So I like where Hodge is going here. Take the points. I think Winnipeg wins a tight game. But the value there is on Hamilton as the underdogs. The Ottawa Red Blacks will visit the Montreal Alouettes on Saturday with Nick Arbuckle under center for the nation's capital while Jeremiah Masoli continues to recover from a leg injury he suffered early last season. The Owls are a slim one and a half point favorite at home. JC, who you got? This game is really a push for me, guys, because I thought for the last five weeks, I'm definitely picking Ottawa in this game. Absolutely. And then all of a sudden, Money Hunter gets hurt in training camp. Shaq Evans goes down with a broken finger. Javon Santos knocks their free agent middle linebacker. He's not going to be ready for two weeks. And then, of course, Jeremiah Mazzoli is not going to be ready under center to start the regular season. That's a lot of big name players that Ottawa is not going to have in their opening day lineup. Now, Montreal is you know, unproven at a lot of spots. They've got some rookie receivers who are going to be starting this week. I've never been a big believer in the tandem of Cody Fajardo and Jason Moss, but I think on this occasion, I am leaning Montreal Alouettes. I just can't put money on the Alouettes as favorites until I see it partly for the reasons that JC said about Jason Moss and Cody Fajardo. I don't think they quite fit together, even though they really like each other and seem to get along. That receiving core is really young. Some players need to emerge there. And I think quite frankly, what this game comes down to is the red blacks being better in the trenches. The offensive line is beefed up. We saw drew Desjardins in the preseason guys taking exception 
after the whistle and protecting his guys. I like that physicality. I like him as a tone setter. And it's one of the reasons why I'll be taking the Ottawa Red Blacks to beat Montreal in week one. Get a little bit of value there. You can take him on the money line too. I don't care that Nick Arbuckle starting at quarterback. I think he's a solid veteran who has a solid grasp of Kari Jones's offense and has developed a rapport there with some of the receivers in Ottawa. Jalen Ackland be a, can be a number one receiver regardless of who is throwing passes. He's passes. He's proven that last year. So I really like the Red Blacks in this spot because everybody's going to be saying what JC is. Well, they got all these guys heard and you know Montreal's kind of got these new guys, but at least they're healthy. Well, I still like the Red Blacks. They're better where it counts on the offensive and defensive lines. One quick note for me, DJ Omajist, whose name I hope I didn't butcher too badly. I've met DJ before, and he's complimented me on how I said his name. Reported today that Greg Ellingson is unlikely to play for the Alouettes due to injury. So if you're looking to balance the books a little bit, right? We talked a lot about the guys that Ottawa's missing. Well, Montreal could be without a guy who I think is by far and away their best receiver for Cody Fajardo. So that will change things a little bit in that game. We won't know all the injury details until a little bit closer to the match, but it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see what the Alouette's receiving core looks like because there's also doubt that Tyson Philpott's going to play. If they don't have Greg Ellingson and Tyson Philpott, is Jason Moss going to actually have to run the ball? Wait and see. <laughs> I, I, I want to know. <laughs> closer to the match. When did we become a, a soccer podcast? I wasn't aware of this change. I've been watch. I've been watching Ted Lasso. That's okay, why. Okay, there we go. Yeah, <laughs> the Saskatchewan Rough Riders and Edmonton Elks will close out Week One on Sunday, where the Elks are three and a half point underdogs at home, where they haven't won in almost three years or almost four years at this stage, almost two full seasons and a half. Both teams missed the postseason a year ago and are under pressure from their respective fan bases to improve in 2023. Who are you taking, Dunk, and why? What's key to understand here is I believe from the odds makers, there's always going to be inflation to take the riders as favorites. So I think there's built-in value based on that from Edmonton in this spot. And I go to that late season game last year at Mosaic Stadium. I was there in person where Taylor Cornelius and the Elks put a win together and Chris Jones's return to Regina since he left for the NFL. And I like Edmonton at home getting points. Chris Jones and his team have heard about this long losing streak. It's like the longest in the history of time, essentially, at this point. And I think they want to put it to bed partly for that and also to get some money for the next game because there's this guaranteed win ticket out there where in one of the sections at Commonwealth Stadium, if you buy a ticket there and the Elks lose at home, you can keep coming back until they win. So I think the Elks have heard enough about it that they're going to go out and do something about it. And I think this line is inflated because of everybody being so excited about Trevor Harris going four for four for 72 yards and a touchdown in his lone preseason drive for the green and white. I actually really like the Rough Riders and the feel around this team heading into the season, but they need to prove it to us in a game. I think it's smart that they've upgraded the offensive line and they brought in Kel Colin Kelly to try to boost the trenches as well. But I think the Elks are sick and tired about hearing about this home losing streak and are going to go out and do something about it, especially with this talented receiving core. Taylor Cornelius, the corn dog, just needs to put it in the radius of Geno Lewis for that dude to come down and get it. Same with Stephen Dunbar. Dylan Mitchell, I think, could be a rising star and take another step this year. And Kevin Brown might be one of the most underrated backs in the league. A solid offensive line. They have Jake Serezna on defense, a couple veterans in the secondary there. I think one guy that's gone under the radar is Luchez Pierfoy. This guy just makes plays wherever he goes. So I like the Elks in this game, especially as underdogs. I also like that line dunk. And I think that the key here is that three and a half, right? The Elks only have to keep the game. They don't have to win. They just have to keep a game with a field goal for that bet to hit. And I think that they can certainly do that. I also think they can win. I agree that they're tired of hearing about this losing streak. And the Riders, I am also a little bit higher on them coming out of that preseason game that I was. But it it is just a preseason game after all. We'll have to see what happens when the bullets are flying 
for real. So to me, that is the prudent pick. I think I am going to pick the Riders to win straight up, but I do like the Elks at least at three and a half. If that line shrinks, I'd be tempted to put a little bit of money on the Riders, but we'll have to wait and see. Okay, let me paint a mental picture for you guys. Trevor Harris looks as advertised as quarterback for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, but Taylor Cornelius goes out there and looks much improved because his receiving core is catching everything out there. Both teams look like improved units. It comes down to the final minutes. Edmonton (laughs) is trailing by one point. Cornelius puts together a drive, throws it up. Eugene Lewis catches it, puts them in field goal range, With no time remaining, out trots 36-year-old British soccer player Dean Faithful for a 45-yard field goal, but he can only hit it from 30, so they lose the game. So I've got Edmonton covering, but losing this game because I don't trust their special teams unit right now because I don't trust their kicker, and I think that's how close the margins are in this particular matchup. JC, the biggest fan of globals out there, doesn't trust the oldest global playing in the CFL right now? What gives, bro? It was 58% in one year of college football, and Chris Jones has said he doesn't trust him outside of 40 yards. How is that your starting field goal (laughs) kicker? That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, and I've been around the CFL for a lot of ridiculous things. Well, I'll give you that, but... Also, we have to remember, you're drinking out of that Believe mug, and the guy's name is literally Faithful. Those two words mean the same thing. So let, let's have a little bit of belief, but I, I also, you know, I think your concern is, is pretty well on point. How have the Elks not signed Mark Leggio by now? Like, Mark Leggio was an 82% kicker last year as a Canadian. That, to me, is mind-boggling. The Elks signed Jake Julian as a punter. Why, why not get, but anyway, whatever. It's time for Hodges Heritage Moment. On this day in 2022, we're reaching back into extremely recent history, boys. Queens University hired two-time Grey Cup winner and Canadian Football Hall of Fame edge rusher Leroy Blue to coach their defensive line. The Golden Gales went 7-1 and in the regular season, but lost to Western in the Yates Cup by a score of 44-14. to Darian Newell, a prospect in the 2024 CFL draft, was sensational at the East-West Bowl and is a name I think all CFL fans should have in mind for next year because I believe he will be a first-round pick in that draft. I'm curious. We'll start with Dunk. Have you had a chance to watch Newell play? Because this guy is unbelievable. He's a beast. I saw him live in person last year when Queens ran rough shot over the Griffin, so much so that my nephews started saying, that Queens team is pretty good. Maybe I'll cheer for them. And I was like, you know, I can't blame you. The Gales played really well that day. And Newell had a game. He's crazy twitchy for his size. He's got some great pass rush moves. Seven sacks last year for the Gales. What really impressed me at that East-West Bowl, I got the combine results. He's 272 pounds, broad jumps, nine feet, 10 inches. That is insane for a man of that size. That's the type of explosion and get off the ball that you're getting from Darian Newell. It's time for the three minute drill. Kenny Lawler is set to miss the two to three weeks of the season after being placed on Winnipeg's suspended list. Why is that, Hodge? Well, first of all, this is one of the reasons I'm feeling the tie cats on that money line a little bit, but. Paul Friesen of the Winnipeg Sun had the reporting on this. Essentially, after Lawler pleaded guilty to the DUI he got two years ago in Winnipeg, he had to reapply for a work permit, and that paperwork is going to take some time to do. The most notable part about this story, boys, his salary each week on game checks is seven grand. He's going to miss out on that money each game he misses. He's still paying for that mistake that he admitted was a stupid mistake. The BC Lions have hired LL Cool J to play the club's home opener on June 17th. Have you ever listened to his music before? I'm not the one to talk about rap music. I've heard (laughs) songs, but when they announced this at halftime, I was sitting in the BC Place press box and I said, the guy from NCIS Los Angeles? Really? I didn't know he did music. (laughs) The Calgary Stampeders. Cut left tackle Derek Dennis as part of their training camp cuts. Was that a surprise, Dunk? 
It actually wasn't because based on people I've talked to around the Stampeders organization, Dennis came in way overweight. And I hesitate to say that in this day and age of people getting canceled, but he was not in football shape. Let's put it that way. And that was one of the main reasons why Dennis was let go. Rookie QB Tyrell Pigrome had another standout performance for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers during the preseason. Are fans in the peg hyped for a dual threat passer? I think that some fans out there, uh, like they've got to be commissioning a statue or getting tattoos. Like fans are completely smitten with this guy. Frankly, it reminds me of the Chris Revolution that happened back <laughs> in 2018 when Chris Treveller stole the hearts and minds of the Blue Bomber faithful. I'll say this, having now interviewed Tyrell in the Bombers locker room post game, he is small. Like he is listed at 5'10". I look back at his pro day numbers. He's 5'9". I'm 6'2", and I felt like a giant standing next to him. That said, my goodness, is he hard for opposing defensive players to see behind Winnipeg's O-line. OSEG president and CEO Mark Gowdy did an interview with Post Media's Tim Baines in which he described the Ottawa Red Blacks 2022 season as a, quote, trifecta of poop, close quote. <laughs> As someone who has made poop analogies on this podcast before, JC, do you agree with his assessment? I don't think he went far enough. I think the past several seasons in, in Ottawa have been a poop factory, a poop <laughs> fountain, if you will. It, it's a whole poop ocean out there in Ottawa. Hopefully they can finally turn it around and sanitize some of that this year. Dunk, you reported that Ottawa receiver Jalen Acklin is set to make $245,000 as part of his new con in 2024 as part of his new contract extension. Is he worth that kind of money next year? I think he is, especially if he goes out and has another 1,000 yard season with the Red Blacks. And I could also see a scenario where they do something similar to this year, lower the cap number, give him a signing bonus to benefit both sides there. Chris Jones is high on Edmonton Elks running back duo of Kevin Brown and newcomer Shannon Brooks. Should he be? I think so. I think Brown has the potential to lead the league in yardage this year. And Brooks is a great bruiser who I think can close out a game kind of in that anti anti Milanovic Litre role who, and mind you, they didn't use him as much as they probably should have last year. Hopefully they use Brooks more. Winnipeg native Sean Civellino. Sil I apologize for butchering that junior has committed to Notre Dame. Do you think the young defensive tackle can make an impact at the power five level? I do. He's an incredible player and it might not come in year one. He might have to redshirt, but this is a guy who could eventually start for a marquee program in the NCAA at some point in his career. The Raggers signed Colin Kelly following the, offensive tackles stint in the XFL. Why was he able to sign in the CFL short, so shortly after his XFL season came to an end? Well, there's some handshake deals between leagues like this, and I think that's what's happened here because one Darnell Sankey, as John Hodge will know, is technically not allowed to sign until his two-year contract with the XFL is over unless it's with the NFL. So I think there's been an agreement under the table or behind the scenes or what have you. Legendary commentator Jim Nance plugged the CFL's upcoming season opening broadcast on CBS Sports during the final round of the Memorial, one of the biggest golf tournaments of the year outside of the majors. How cool was it to hear Nance talking about the CFL? It was very cool, and I give CBS full credit for putting their money where their mouth is. The CFL needs to be more present on American television. One of the ways to make that happen is with these types of bumpers and advertisements. That'll get people to tune in. We thank you as always for listening to the Three Donation Podcast. We'll see you next week when the first season of or first week of regular season action will be in the books.